Well, today, after our uh, big celebrating 10-year service last week, we get back to our series in the New Testament book of Romans. And the title of my talk is Family Benefits. Now, for the past 10 years, our family's health insurance has been through Janice job. She teaches at OU. And over there, each November, you're supposed to contact the Department of Human Resources and see if you want or need to have any changes to your plans. However, when you call them, they just assume that you know and are familiar with all the terms and abbreviations related to health care and so forth that they deal with on a daily basis, but, you know, people like us hardly use. So here's an example of how my conversation with them goes. Hi, my name is Russ Martin, and we have a family health insurance there through my wife, Janet. And they say, oh, yes, there has been a change to your HMO because your MD has switched PPOs, and so your MRI done at the ER and your RX co-payments are going UPS because as a VIP of the AARP, the IRS says that, FYI, the IOU you sent in for your PTSD is a bunch of BS. That, that's, 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 basically, that's basically what they say to me. I have no idea what they're talking about. No idea. Well, hopefully the family benefits that I'm talking about today will be slightly easier to understand than, than all that stuff. The scriptures we're looking at, Romans 8, verses 14 through 17, it says, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are, uh, are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you no longer live in fear. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs to God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Now, these verses contain four benefits of being a member of God's family, and I want to go through those in just a moment. But, you know, as I was looking at this today and thinking about the idea of being children of God, being in God's family, it reminded me of an issue that uh, is so prevalent today, it practically is li like the air we breathe in this country, and that is what's called universalism. And because it's so common, I want to speak on this for a few minutes, uh, so you're going to kind of get like two talks in one, hopefully not longer than one talk, but two, sort of two talks in one. And universalism, and this is important as we talk about being children of God or in the family of God is the idea. Universalism is the belief that all religions, all beliefs, everybody on earth is God's child and every person on earth goes to heaven when they die. However, while the Bible does teach that we are all created by God and that each person on earth is equally loved, equally valued by God, and each person on earth has an equal opportunity to be in the family of God, the Bible does not teach that all people are God's children and or that all people will go to heaven someday. I remember clear back to my senior year in high school. I took a class called Comparative Religions. And I recall the teacher making a statement that went something like this. He said, intelligent people today realize that all religions are simply like different paths that lead to the top of the same mountain. Perhaps you've heard that or variations of that theme. What do you think? Are all religions pretty much the same? Do all religions really, when it comes down to it, worship the same God, but maybe just in different ways according to their cultures and customs? Well, this is an issue of tremendous importance because the ramifications are eternal. So before we get into the four benefits of being a member of God's family, first I want to address universalism. And I want to do it by considering three common beliefs today. First common belief is that all religions are basically the same. A lot of people in our country, that is their viewpoint. In other words, all religions fundamentally teach the same thing, so it doesn't really matter which particular one you follow. Most major world religions believe in a higher power. They teach people that they should live a life of love, that they should choose right over wrong, that they should care for their families, and so forth. So in a way, it's true. Most world religions share some basic values and beliefs concerning morality and looking beyond ourselves to a higher power. But upon further inspection, there are some differences. And to show you what I mean, I want to very briefly give you an overview of what are considered the five major world religions today. 
First is Hinduism. Now, we normally tend to associate Hinduism with where? India. India. Hindus are what are called pantheistic, which means that God and the universe are the same. The mountains are God, and God is the mountains, and God is this building and everything and trees, and they are indistinguishable. A second major world religion is Buddhism, which is often associated with the Far East. Buddhism has some similarities to Hinduism because Buddhism was founded by a man who had broken away from Hinduism. The ultimate goal in Buddhism is referred to as nirvana, which is to them the extinction of desire. According to Buddhist teaching, all pain and suffering come from desire. And if this desire can be overcome by following what they call the Eightfold Path to Enlightenment, one can achieve nirvana, which is total nothingness. That's Buddhism. Third world religion, Islam. Now, Muslims have five basic pillars or observances that they follow. Number one, the creed of, or statement of belief. There is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the prophet of Allah. Second, ritual prayers performed five days, uh, four or five times a day facing Mecca. Number three, alms giving, giving uh, offering one fortieth of their income to the needy. Number four, the observance of Ramadan. They fast and they have to face Mecca during daylight hours. And fifth, the pilgrimage to Mecca required of all Muslims before they die. Now the word Mus or Islam uh, means submission. And if you submit to their te teachings, which in addition to the five pillars includes fasting and abstinence and self-denial, then when you die, you go to paradise. Which, ironically enough, when you get there, you get to ind indulge in all the things you had to abstain from in this life. You know, wine, women, and song. Not that, not that much song. Next is Judaism. Those of you who are familiar with the Old Testament of the Bible, you probably know that Abraham is the father of Judaism. And there's a heavy emph emphasis on laws and traditions to be followed, and that Judaism rejects Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Now, along the, that line, here are three religious truths. One, the Jews did not recognize Jesus as Messiah. Two, Protestants do not recognize the Pope as the leader of the Christian faith. And three, Baptists do not recognize each other at the liquor store. <laughs> so those are three. And finally, the fifth major world religion is Christianity, which is unique and different from other religions in many ways, and I'm just going to mention three of them, all right? First, among the religious leaders who have attracted large followings throughout history, Christ alone claimed to be God in the flesh. The Buddha never claimed to be God. Abraham never said that he was Jehovah. Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, and Mary Baker Eddy, the founder of Christian science, and they never, never professed to be God. Muhammad did not claim to be Allah. Only Jesus made that claim. He said in John 14, 9, He who has seen me has seen the Father. In John 10, verse 30, I and my Father are one. To which the Jewish religious leaders of that day recognized what he was saying and were outraged. That's blasphemy because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Now, some people would argue that Jesus himself never made those claims, but that his followers later added those into the scriptures, putting words in his mouth, so to speak. And we don't have time this morning to go into all the reasons and evidences that repudiate that theory, but if you've ever had those kinds of thoughts, I would encourage you to pick up uh, a copy of a CD or a DVD of a message I did a couple of years ago from a series on reasonable doubts where he talked about, is the Bible filled with mistakes and myths? Because in that message, we established the fact that the historical evidence clearly indicates that the Bible is without question the single best documented piece of ancient literature there is in the world. The Bible passes the test of accuracy and historical reliability with flying colors. And the evidence clearly substantiates the fact that Jesus did indeed make those claims. And not only did he make them, he backed them up by performing miracles. He fulfilled hundreds of Old Testament prophecies. And finally, from rising from the dead. Which brings us to the second significant difference between Christianity and other religions. Jesus resurrected from the dead. And that sort of, in a way, exposes other religious leaders for who they were, which is someone who stepped onto the stage at a certain point in history, 
maybe lived a wonderful life, espoused some uh, religious principles, and then they died. Now, some of you have done quite a bit of traveling in your life. And, you know, if you went on a world tour, you could stand before the tombs and the shrines of all the great religious leaders in history. And as you stood there in front of the tombs of those religious leaders, a realization would hit you. They're dead. They're all dead. And I've come to the conclusion that I don't want to devote the rest of my life and to worship a dead guy. Now, I can appreciate his teachings. I can admire his good deeds. But I'm going to draw the line at worshiping and devoting my life to a dead guy. Because no matter how big he was for some piece of history, he couldn't conquer death. Therefore, he simply was a man, not God or the Son of God. Jesus alone stands above the rest as the only one to conquer death. And I wish we could all just kind of load up on a plane this afternoon and fly to Israel, and you could stand right in front of that empty tomb of Jesus Christ, and you would be more convinced than ever that Christianity is on a whole other level than other ideologies or religions in the world. All right, a third way in which Christianity is unique from other religions is that other religions emphasize do, Christianity's emphasis on done. In every other religious system, it is essentially a do-it-yourself proposition. You have to earn or merit, you know, through observing certain rituals, or performing good deeds, and saying so many Hail Marys, or this or that, all kinds of different things, following the Eightfold Path to Enlightenment or the Five Pillars, you earn your way into God's good graces and into heaven. Christianity is totally different. It's not what we can do. It's what Christ has already done for us on the cross that makes salvation possible. He does for us what we could not do for ourselves. And so the Christian faith is unique, and that uniqueness comes from Jesus himself. Other religious leaders would say, follow me, and I'll show you the way to salvation. Jesus said, I am the way to salvation. Other religious leaders say, follow me, and I will teach you great truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. Other religious leaders say, follow me, and you will be enlightened. Jesus said, I am the light. So I think you'll see for yourself that all religions are not, they're not exactly the same. All right? Now I want to continue a little bit on this universalism. Here's a second common belief that all religions are equally true or equally valid. In other words, even if there is a difference between these different religions, who's to say that yours is right and mine is wrong? And this is the idea that, you know, I have my truth and you can have your truth and to each his own. Live and let live. Now this belief that all religions are equally valid has a certain appeal, especially in our politically correct culture. I mean, we live in a society where under our Constitution, all religious viewpoints are equally protected. Anybody can believe whatever they want. The problem is that people jump to the erroneous conclusion that because different philosophies are equally protected, then they must be equally valid, equally true. However, even though all religions are protected under our Constitution, that really doesn't have anything to do with whether or not they're based on truth. You know, sometimes today you'll hear stories of men who are in federal prison who complain that their rights are being violated because they're not able to practice their religion. And then you hear that their religious beliefs require that they eat steak every day and that they have sex every day and that they smoke marijuana every day. Well, it's not too difficult to discern what's going on there. Someone is abusing the freedom of religion that America stands for. But when it comes to legitimate religions, like the big world religions I mentioned a moment ago, are all religions equally valid? Well, think about it like this. Islam teaches that Jesus was not the Son of God, but simply a great prophet. Christianity teaches that Jesus was the Son of God. Both views cannot be right. Islam teaches that the Bible is corrupted and that the Gospels are not an authentic record of Jesus' words. Christianity holds that the Bible is accurate, inspired even. Muslims believe that when Jesus said, I will send you another comforter, the one who will guide you into all truth, that he was alluding to the coming of the prophet Muhammad. Christianity holds that Jesus was referring to the Holy Spirit. Hinduism teaches reincarnation. You know, life is recycled from one life form to another. Christianity teaches that each person lives one life and then upon death, will stand before God. Hinduism also teaches that God and the, crea and the creation are one and the same. Christianity teaches that God is independent of his creation. Judaism holds that Jesus Christ was not the Messiah, 
God's Savior of the world. Christianity contends that he is. And I could go on and on and on with examples pointing to the fact that all religions cannot be true at the same time because they teach many things that are complete opposite from one another. And so this idea that all religions can be equally valid, equally true, it kind of doesn't stand to reason. Well, the third common belief that people have that sort of created some of this universalism is the belief that Christians are so narrow-minded and intolerant when they say that Jesus is the only way to heaven. Now, along that line, there's a rabbi, uh, Shmuley Botich, I think is how you say his name. And he says, I am absolutely against any religion that says one faith is superior to another. I don't see how that is any different than spiritual racism. It's a way of saying that we are closer to God than you, and that's what leads to hatred. Charles Templeton adds, Christians are a small minority in the world. Approximately four out of every five people on the face of the earth believe in gods other than the Christian God. The more than six billion people who live on earth revere or worship more than 300 gods. And if one includes animal or tribal religions, or animalist or tribal religions, the number raises to more than 3,000 gods. Are we to believe that only Christians are right? Now, my guess is that some of you, especially if you're kind of a seeker, have had thought, that thought about that. And you're, you know, you kind of chaff at the idea that, well, why does Jesus have to be the only way to God? I mean, especially living in a world where there seems to be endless options in virtually every area of life, it just doesn't seem right that Christians to hold such a narrow and intolerant view. However, did you know that although uh, Indian philosopher Swami Vivek in Nadada says, we Hindus accept all religions as true. What that really means in effect though is Hinduism allows you to practice your religion as long as you buy into certain notions, uh, their notions of truth. Because Hinduism is absolutely uncompromising on at least two, two issues, the law of karma and reincarnation. In reality, the statement that Christians are arrogant, claiming exclusivity, ignores the fact that almost every religion in the world does the same thing. Now, I would certainly acknowledge that some Christians do come across as very narrow-minded. And if they are intolerant and narrow-minded concerning issues like uh, gender or sexism or racism or so forth, well, they're dead wrong, you know. They're not representative of what the Bible teaches that they discriminate against somebody because they're a female or because of their race or whatever, their color. However, when it comes to this question of, you know, there are so many religions in the world, how can Christians say their way is the only right way? We have to be reminded it was Jesus himself who made that claim in John 14, 6. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus did not teach there are many roads to God, and I'm probably the best option. He's saying that he is the way. And if Jesus had said there were 10 alternative ways, I'd stand up here and tell you there are 10 alternative ways. We would say that, but the Bible says there's only one. Now, maybe you've seen or heard about this analogy that religion is like several blind people feeling of an elephant and trying to identify what it is. And one person feels a leg, and he says, oh, this is a tree. And another person gets hold of the tail and says, no, this is a rope. And another person gets hold of the ear and says, this is a fan or this is, this is a, you know, a, a, a fan. No, I was thinking about the, the, the tusk. It's a, it's a spear. And this is intended to show how people can have a similar experience or a similar search and yet come out to very differing views. The trouble with that analogy is that there's an objective, there's an objective truth there. It's not subjective. And if a person says, well, it's a tree, or it's a rope, or it's a fan, well, they're wrong, because regardless of personal convictions or conclusions, no matter how sincerely held, the fact remains that what they're all feeling of is an elephant. There are some things in, world, in the world that are objective truths. Jesus repeatedly asserted that regardless of varying beliefs or viewpoints, no matter how sincerely felt, the reality is that he is indeed the only way to God. Now, what has made the lie of universalism even more gravely serious in recent years is that popular pastors, like you may remember Carlton Pearson from Tulsa, a few years ago broke off and then Rob Bell. They've joined the, the voices of those who say, all religions are the same. Doesn't matter what you believe. You know, uh, Rob Bell's book is called Love Wins Over Everything. It, you know, truth doesn't matter. 
and everybody goes to heaven when they die. And a lot of people buy into that, especially when so-called religious Christian people are, are saying it, because people want to believe that. But it is not what Jesus taught, not what the Bible says. You know, it's wonderful when we can agree with other people. Most of us would per, prefer agreeing with disagreeing with people. The Bible tells us, to those of us who are followers of Christ, we must always act respectful of other people, their faiths, but at the same time, lovingly proclaim that Jesus is God's means to salvation and eternal life. So that's my, the briefest overview of universalism that I can give you. And now let me give you about the last one-fourth of my talk here today. The four family benefits that we as believers, members of the family of God, enjoy. First is God's guidance in our lives. Romans 8 verse 14 says, Those who are led by the Spirit are the children of God. Now, we all know from personal experience how life can seem like a maze sometimes. Like, what decision should I make about this? Should we buy that house? Should I date or marry this person? What career field? Well, how do I solve this problem, this medical problem? Should I do this? Should I do that? We, we, you know, on a regular basis, we face some pretty significant decisions. And how nice it is to have a guide. Someone there who has wisdom, who's been there before, and who can provide, you know, perspective. Wise counsel for life's important decisions. Now, over in John chapter 10, Jesus says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Now, here Jesus is referring to a phenomenon that probably none of us have ever witnessed firsthand, but back in Jesus' day, and in some places around the world today, there are a lot of shepherds, a lot of sheep grazing, and there are areas that are called sheep folds. They're big areas, usually fenced in, where maybe seven or eight shepherds would have their flocks of sheep all mingling together. But any one of them can walk into that sheepfold called his sheep, and his sheep will immediately separate themselves and just walk right out with that shepherd because they recognize his voice, and they follow him. And that's what Jesus is referring to in this verse. And if we ask him, and if we have a willing heart to follow, God will, gu God will guide our steps. God will guide our decisions. He'll give us wisdom in life. Family benefit number two, we have been adopted into God's family. Verse 15 also refers to that. You know, growing up, I was the baby in the family, uh, the favorite, the youngest of six. And occasionally, my older sisters and brother would tell me, ah, oh, you're adopted anyway. <laughs> Any of your older brothers and sisters do this? And for some reason, I always interpreted that as a bad thing. No, I'm not adopted. You know, I'd cry and run out or whatever. I'm not adopted. And the idea, though, when people say, oh, you were just adopted, is that your, your real parents didn't want you. So they just gave you away to be adopted by some other family. And sadly, there are people who spend their entire lives feeling bad, feeling rejected, feeling unwanted because they were adopted. Some of you, I'm sure, can relate to that. On the other hand, there are people who say, you know, being adopted has always made me feel so special because my parents chose me. They didn't have to take me in. They didn't have to love me. They didn't have to provide for me. They chose me. So there are two very different ways of seeing it. But when it comes to being in God's family, there's only the positive side. God wanted you. God chose to invite you into his family. A third family benefit is intimacy with God. Now, while we might normally think of the word intimacy in a sexual connotation, it can also be used to describe a particularly close relationship of any kind. In verse 15, we come across a word that is only used three times in the entire Bible. It's the word Abba, which means father. But more specifically, how we think of using the word daddy. Interestingly, in Mark chapter 14, it's the word Jesus used when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, just about to be betrayed, beat with 39 lashes, crucified. He knew his death was imminent, and he's praying, and he cried out, Abba, or Daddy, to God the Father. This is a term of dependency, of affection, of intimacy. And that's the kind of relationship you can have with the God of the universe when you're a member, member of his family. 
You are beloved. He cherishes you. You know, you're like one of his beloved children. You can have an intimate, close relationship. Well, family benefit number four, you are an heir with an, inher an incredible inheritance. You know, when my mother passed away at age 98, just a little over a year ago now, uh, she had named me executor of her will. Actually, it was me and my brother, but since he lives in the Philippines, in reality, it was me. Never been an executor of a will before, and I found out that my job was to ensure that everything in her estate was done exactly according to her wishes. Now, if I was, happened to be mad at one of my brothers or sisters, like, well, you're not getting any. I can't do that, see? I just have to do what she said. I have to do what she wanted. I spent most of my life doing what she wanted. Okay, a very small portion, actually, but uh, anyway. Now, in my mother's case, she was not wealthy. You know, she didn't have a lot of uh, big fortune or, or properties or land or homes or anything like that. However, you know, I was thinking about this week, my brother and my sisters, we were heirs to something much more valuable. We were heirs to a great legacy that my parents left, not in money, but in love, happiness, faith, serving God. And you, as a born-again believer and follower of Jesus, you are an heir. That's what this verse says. You have inherited the free gift of eternal life. You have inherited goodness and mercy that will follow you all the days of your life. You have inherited love and faithfulness of God in your life. You have inherited His provision, His protection over you, His grace over you, His companionship with you every day of your life. You've inherited that. It's yours. You have inherited a mansion in heaven one day. You have inherited the promises of no more tears, no more sorrow, no more separation, no more illness, no more death. You have inherited a home in heaven that will last forever and ever and ever. And God's inheritance for his children is going to be beyond our wildest imaginations. So as we finish up today, let me just ask you, are you enjoying these and other benefits of being a child of God, a member of his family? Are you enjoying them? You know, I hope so because he will guide you and he has invited you and adopted you and welcomed you into his family. And he wants to have a very close, intimate relationship with you. And you and I are his heirs. And his will, in his will, the Bible, it says that he wants to bless you in this life and take you to heaven forever in the next life. It's a pretty good deal being a part of the family of God. Let's stand. We'll have our closing prayer. Lord, today we just come before you and we're grateful that the scriptures and our faith is not based on wishful thinking or things that were said a long time ago and hopefully they've been passed down to us accurately. Or our faith is based on solid fact, evidences, truths that have withstood the test of time. And Lord, from that we find out that anyone can become a part of your family. Everyone is invited in. And when we open up our hearts and we come in, we become one of your children in a, in a new sense besides just children from creation. But you, you just change our lives in so many ways. Your provision, your protection, your love, your forgiveness, your guidance, you know, all these many benefits of being a part of your family. And I pray, God, that we would embrace those things. We would enjoy those things more. We would access those things more. And God, all we did was open our hearts. We didn't do anything else, nothing else we really could do. We didn't deserve any of this stuff. And so, God, today we worship you and we thank you for that. You are so kind-hearted, so generous, so, you know, open and willing and... and um, and so filled with love for all of us. And God, I pray that we would take this love that we've received and go out this week and just show it to everybody that we come into contact with. In small ways, with words, with actions, and we would share your love that you have for people, that more people might sense it, be gripped by it, and become a child of yours also. Pray all that in Jesus' name. Amen.
All right, thanks a lot for coming, you guys. We'll see you next Sunday.